Last week, as we have already uh, talked about, we began our five-week series looking at the five alones. There they are written up on top for you, and they're in order now, which is awesome. And I want to inscribe it on your minds that it is Scripture alone that makes us wise for salvation. How? By proclaiming that, it, that salvation is by grace alone. And this is through faith alone, in Christ alone, and this is all for the glory of God alone. There should be a slideshow coming up, but I'm not too sure if that's going to work today, and that doesn't matter. And so last week, we looked at Scripture alone. Why did we go with Scripture alone first? We went because if you don't have Scripture as the foundation, then the rest of it falls apart. And we saw how the question of authority, do you remember that? The authority scales Scripture or tradition and how that ignited the Reformation in the 16th century. And our young monk, Martin Luther, who would not recant from holding Scripture alone as the sole authority. Well, that guy, Luther, he wasn't finished there. And during his days as a monk, so that's before he becomes the, the leader of the Reformation, okay? This is when he's just a monk. Um, as a monk, Luther was super, super keen. Now, does anyone know the story of Luther? Who, who he knows the story sort of of Luther? Who he doesn't really know the story of Luther? Who just didn't put their hand up at all? Yeah, right. Okay. So quick, quick background for you. Okay. So Luther is a law student. His father is a coal miner, not going to be a miner, mate. You're going to go, you're going to do law. He's a law student and he's on his way. I can't remember if it's to visit mum and dad or back from visiting mum and dad to go back to university. And he's caught in an electrical storm. Okay. This is in East Germany, in Saxony, Germany. And when caught in that storm, he freaks out. There's lightning bolts landing around him. He's right in the epicenter of it. He falls to the ground and he cries out to the patron saint of miners. It's the only saint he knows because he comes from a family of miners. He calls out to St. Anne, whoever St. Anne is, and says, save me and I'll become a monk. Be careful what you say. So he doesn't die from an electrical storm. So therefore, he... Uh, make sure that that's exactly what it does. Within two weeks, he's enrolled at the monastery in a little town called Erfurt in Germany. And that is where he starts his biblical studies. And he has a guy there called Stalpitz, von Stalpitz, who is like his mentor. And this is obviously all within Catholicism. And it's Stalpitz. We owe a huge debt to that man because he told Luther to go and read the Bible. Don't read the papal documents. Go read the Bible. Okay, the rebellion has already started. You know, it's hidden. And, it, and that's exactly what Luther does. So he is super, super keen. But while he's reading the Bible, he's also doing all the things that you do as a monk. What do you do as a monk? Pray when you walk around humming, don't you? Yeah? Okay. Well, this is the sort of things that he got up to. One of the things he did is he would go down to the town before we get to that point, but he'd go down to the town and he would live like a pauper in order to um, not have any wealth in this world because a rich man cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You see his problems. He would go to confession six times a day. And as he's walking out of confession after his sixth visit... Imagine the dude in the box, eh? Hey? That's Luther again. What is it this time? You know, I squished, I squished a mouse. I don't know. Anyway, just context of today, you know. Anyway, but as he would leave the confession booth after six times of going to confession, he'd be really, really proud that he'd confessed all of his sin, only to get to his room, realise that pride is a sin, turn back around and go back to confession to confess his pride. You get the idea. As he puts it, and it should come up on that screen maybe, I was a good monk and I kept the rule of my order so strictly that I may say that, that if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. If I had kept on any longer, I should have killed myself with vigils, prayers, reading and other 
work. This is the A grade student. This is the, te- this is the one that the teacher goes, <sighs> he's going to find you know, all the problems that I've got as well. He was working hard to get to heaven. Salvation based on what he did along with what God had done through Jesus. Relics, pilgrimages, chants, indulgences, recitals. How far did he go? He even went on a pilgrimage to Rome. Hopefully I'll find satisfaction there. But in all of it, he found no peace, no security, no firm foundation. We could say that his faith was a house of cards, just waiting for one thing to be pulled out. And here was the problem. He had the question, are we saved by what we do? Is everything I do as a monk, does that save me? Am I saved by my hand or by what God has done? The works of our hands, I've done this or that. I gave to the poor, I don't smoke. I pay my taxes, I don't speed, I haven't killed anybody. I'm generally a good person. I recycle. I divide my waste into the green bin and the red bin and the whatever other coloured bin there is. What colour bins do you have in Forbes? You have the yellow, that's recycling, that's plastic and stuff. And then you've got the red one. And green is green waste. Yeah. Do you get to heaven because you aren't colourblind? And so you know which bin to put it in? I even take my prawn heads out of the plastic bag when I put them in the green bin. My ledger is in the black. I don't owe anybody anything. I helped the lady across the road. Does any of this merit salvation? Saved because of our works. Is that even possible? Or is it the things, is it the things that we do that work alongside, that cooperate with God's rescuing act of Jesus crucified? Is that how it works? You know, God's done this, and then I do this, and somehow they're going to mesh together and we go to heaven. Is that how we do it? Or is it a case of we contribute nothing? We, can't, we don't have anything to contribute to salvation. Is it up to us at all? Or is it all on God? This was the dilemma for Luther. And this is the dilemma for the people of that day as well. And this is still the dilemma for so many people now. If you think back to the story of Jesus meeting the rich young man in Jericho, do you remember that story? Yeah? What was that man's dilemma? What does he say? He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I've kept all the law, right? Tick, 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 tick. I've done all that. What must I do? Because I can see that that's not enough. What must I do? Does humanity have the capacity to contribute to salvation? There is the dilemma. And perhaps this is your dilemma too. Have you been good enough? At the end of this earthly life, and it's not very long, although it might seem very long sometimes. In reality, it's about 80 years. It's not very long. At the end of this earthly life, does eternal life, does heaven await you? And if it does, how do you know? Because the ledger is right? Well, if we hold that scripture alone is the authority, superseding any other writings, opinions, stories and teachings and traditions of people, then it should be logic to us, pure logic, 
that what scripture actually has to say on this should be listened to. Is that a, is that a big jump for us to make or are we good with that one? How do we know? Well, let's look to scripture. And that supersedes your own thoughts too. There's a difficult one because we all bring our own thoughts with us everywhere. Bags are packed all the time on that one. And so what did Luther do? Luther turned to Scripture alone. And so let's do that. What did he find? I want you to open your Bibles and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Now we return to the dusty plain of Moab. Remember, I showed you that on the map last week. Uh, if you want to visualise it, you have the Dead Sea, you've got the uh, Sea of Galilee above it, the Jordan running between. We're at the top of the Dead Sea on the right-hand side, on the eastern side. Interestingly, there was an article this week with the ABC concerning the Dead Sea Scrolls, and that journalist is 100% certain that the Dead Sea is west of Jerusalem. That's the Mediterranean Sea, not the Dead Sea. It's east of Jerusalem, just so, in case you read that article. Okay, but we're on that dusty plain of Moab. And last week, we touched on the passages before and after chapter 7, being chapter 6 and chapter 8, as Moses taught the people in his final sermons, preparing them to enter the promised land. There is the dusty plain of Moab. And do you remember the urging of Moses upon the people? Follow the Lord, keep his commands, don't forget him, teach your children, let his word guide you in every step of life. And then we saw, we jumped forward to two kings, and we saw how Josiah turned to the Lord with all of his heart and soul and strength. And he broke down the altars and smashed the sacred stones, and he burnt the idols in the fire in obedience to Deuteronomy. And we learned how he celebrated the Passover, something that had not been done in Israel for centuries, in obedience to Scripture alone, remembering God's great act of salvation, the Exodus. We want to ask you, those people on that plane, what is their track record? Did they recycle? Well, they did. They recycled their jewellery and put it in the fire and out popped a calf, apparently. Was that a good track record? Hmm. What, What is their history? Well, they were slaves in Egypt. They were powerless in Egypt. There was no future for them there. They were essentially dead. Their boys, their baby boys, had been massacred had been thrown in the river, had been killed. Do you remember that story? Yeah. Is that just a story? Is, it just, is that a story that belongs out in the, you know, the kids' church Sunday school room? Is that where that story belongs? Is that all it was? Is it real? Was there an entire generation of baby boys who were murdered? Someone says, yep. Yeah. How do you know? Well, actually, they're doing a dig in Egypt right now. Did you know that? You, don't, you won't see it on the news. It stopped for COVID. But that dig, they're using sonar, they're using depth sounders, and they're also excavating. And guess what the graves say? The, the, the city that they're looking at is all Semitic in design. Semitic, sons of Shem. It's where the Israelites come from. This is Jacob's people. Okay, it's their design. It's canonic design of houses in Egypt. And what do the graves say? There is a disproportionate pelvic structure in the graves. There is way, way, way more women than men. The boys are missing. Where did they go? They went into the Nile crocodile. That's where they went. That's their track record. They were essentially dead. They're powerless. They're worthless. Now, they were rescued by the mighty hand of God, the ten plagues, the story that we often leave in the Sunday school room as well, the crossing of the sea on dry dry ground, bringing them out of Egypt, God's great act of salvation, the Exodus. What was their response to the Exodus, to God's great act of salvation? 
complained, grumbled and complained. How fast? Oh, pretty fast. Like it wasn't even finished. They ignored God, the God who saved them, and they turned to their jewellery and worshipped their calf that popped out of the fire. Don't know how it came, said Aaron, didn't he? Didn't he say, I just put the, the gold in and out popped the calf? Hmm, I'm pretty sure my children tried that. I don't know where all this crayon came from on the walls. They grumbled and complained again. Now, one of the things that they grumbled about, and this is probably fair, water. I've, I've been to that dusty plain in autumn. It was 44 degrees in autumn. And it has a humidity of like negative a billion. Okay, there's 50 mils of rain falls there in a year. That's how dry that puppy is. Yeah, go farm that one. Yeah, not likely. Uh, just down the road from here, like just down the road, like 60 k's or something, is the city of Petra. Maybe 100 k's. Yeah, does everyone know the city? Right, the, the city carved in the rock, Indiana Jones, you know, that place. I, I walked around there in autumn, in whatever heat it was, 42 degrees that day. I drank, I walked for one day through that city. It was about 12, 15, maybe 18 kilometres of walking. And I drank eight litres of water. And I did not go to the toilet all day. Yeah, it's very dry. And you're like, yeah, 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 all the time. Yeah, never knew how good pomegranate juice was until that day. Happy days. Yes, they grumbled and complained. And I can understand where is the water. I get that one. What else did they complain about? Food, yes. How good was their complaint? Do you remember it? Oh, back in Egypt, we just hung around the fire, stood around the, and just roasted our meat whenever we wanted to. We had leeks and cucumbers to eat, like, in abundance. We had a grocery shop, basically, is what their claim is. Do you remember that? Remember those Sunday school stories? Yeah. As for this stuff on the ground, it's very boring. What was the stuff? Manna. manna. Do you know what the word manna means? What is it? What is it? For 40 years, they ate this stuff that they called, what is it? <laughs> it's pretty good. Do you remember that? We don't have any meat. So God says, I'm going to give you so much quail that's going to be like a metre deep in the camp and it's going to come out your nostrils. Yeah. But they grumbled and complained. They didn't trust God to deliver them into the land as he's promised. Go, he says. They go, uh -uh. the dudes up there, they're big and they've got castles. They've got big walls and they're strong. We look like grasshoppers. Go! No. Okay, don't go. Yep, we're going to go. How does this work? They didn't obey the Lord's commands. They have no grounds of claiming a right standing with God. That a righteousness, right they don't have that. They have no grounds to claim that God owes them something. I mean, think about that one. Oh, you brought us out here into the desert. Well, you can go back. No one's keeping. You can go. You can go back to Egypt if you want. They have no claim to say that the works of their hands are cooperating with God. And yet, here's what we have. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 5, read along as Andrew reads for us. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples of the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Why did God save them from Egypt? 
Because he loves them. Why did God not destroy them all when they sinned? Because God loves them. This is Sunday school answers now. Okay, Because God loved them. Why is God giving them the land? <sighs> Who was first? You didn't put your hand up, so you don't get the prize. I don't have a prize this week. I'll have prizes next week for you. Okay? Because God loves them, they are holy to the Lord. Verse 6. Because God loves them, God has chosen them out of all people on the face of the earth. Because God loves them, they are his people. And as his people, they are in relationship with him. Because God loves them, they are his treasured possession. The Hebrew words there for treasured possession literally mean the treasure of the king. What are these people? They are the treasure of the king. And Peter says, you are the treasure of the king, his treasured possession. The people don't deserve this. Are they really treasure of a king? This stinking manna stuff, what is it? Are they really treasure? Well, to God they are. But they don't deserve it. They don't merit this favour before God. His love for them, his saving work, bringing them out of Egypt. He's sustaining them for 40 years. He's leading them to the promised land to take possession of it. None of this is earned. It is all of God. It is an unmerited gift or unmerited favour. And that, my friends, is the definition of grace. Unmerited favour. Or unmerited gift. It is undeserved. And why does God give this gift? Because this is his character. Verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations. Now, that verse that uh, the people are being taught on the plains of uh, Moab at the end of Deuteron- at, at the end of Moses' life in Deuteronomy, that's actually a paraphrase of a bigger verse. And that bigger verse is at the start of Moses' ministry to the people at Sinai. And so what I want you to do, I want you to grab your Bibles and flick back three, uh, not three chapters, three books, to the book of Exodus and go to Exodus 34. And Andrew's going to read from uh, verse 5 of Exodus 34. To put the context quickly, Moses is up the mountain and he's sorting out some stuff with God. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. If there is one verse in the Bible that you should impress upon your heart, that you can recite at any day, that is the verse. Because that is God's description of himself. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. When Satan comes at you and says, you filthy, vile person, you are not loved, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. There's a particular Hebrew word used to describe that character. Can anyone tell me what it is? No, it's the name of God, 
But that character description actually has, a, has its own word. Adonai. No, Adonai means Lord or the one who commands. The word is, you, you've got to get it Middle Eastern. You've got to get it like chesed. Totally, yes. Okay, in, in, a, in English speaking, we would just call it hesed. It's, you, you will never see it written in scripture because it's a, it's a language thing, but it is C-H-E-S-E-D or H-E-S-E-D if you get to the lazy people. The hesed of God, his description of himself. The Lord is hesed and hesed is defined by the Lord. And the centerpiece of hesed is gracious. Grace. Full of grace. Because of the hesed of God, the people on the plains of Moab are recipients of God's unmerited favour. Not because of what they have done, but because of his character. God has set his affection upon them because of hesed. And scripture drips with hesed all the way. All those big questions that kids ask, or you probably ask as well, they're actually answered by that. Chesed is the Sunday school answer. I'm going to give you a few. Why didn't God just destroy Adam and Eve for their sin? Like, it wasn't that hard to make them. Surely he could just make some more. Like, get rid of the bad ones and start again. Why not? Because of Chesed, because of God's grace. He's gracious. Why, didn't, why did God allow Noah and his family to survive? I mean, frankly, he got rid of all the other witnesses. It wouldn't be hard to like sink the boat, right? So why didn't he? Would have solved the problem. Noah gets drunk like day two. Like why, why not? Because of hesed, because of grace. Why didn't God just destroy Israel when they built the calf, when they grumbled and complained, when they didn't go, when they did go, when they shouldn't have gone, blah, 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 blah. blah. Why didn't he just knock them off, start again? He was going to. He was going to. He's actually, I'm going to destroy these and Moses, I'm going to restart with you. And Moses goes, oh, 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 oh. no. I said, because of grace. All through the Psalms. What do the Psalms say again and again and again and again? May God be gracious to us and bless us. Hesed. In actual fact, David recites the Hesed of God inside the Psalms. The very act of Jesus coming here, taking on the very nature of a man, person. Think about that. How was creation supposed to be? In the image of God, he created them, male and female, us in the image of God. What does Jesus have to do? Has to come in the appearance of us. In my putridness and in your disgracefulness, that's how Jesus has to come, in your appearance. Has said. To a world that frankly does not give us stuff. They didn't give us stuff then, and the world doesn't give us stuff today. But he came to show true love, compassion, and grace. To demonstrate the gift is given to those who do not deserve. His death in exchange for our death. Or as Jesus put it, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. This is the Hesed of God in full-blown 4K. Don't know what it means, 4K. 4 Flat screen, full-blown action. God's grace on display to the universe. A man on a cross. And just like God setting his affection upon those people on the plains of Moab, the grace of God neither originates in or with and nor is affected by people. Oh, how happy I am about that. That it, I cannot 
affect God's grace. Do you feel good about that? Mm. Because if it was up to me, oh, I would have stuffed it up. I would corrupt it. Jesus didn't go to the cross because there's lots of people. He didn't go to the cross because there's not enough people. He didn't get nails driven into him because someone was kind to the little old lady and let her cross the road. Jesus didn't wear a crown of thorns because you don't smoke and you recycle. He didn't go through the suffering because you kept the law. He was crucified because of God's character, because of God's grace. And he was raised from the dead because of the same character. Because we've got nothing to contribute to this. Humanity is entirely helpless. That mighty act of salvation 2,000 years ago is grace alone. And it is initiated by God alone. The Apostle Paul is at pains to remind people of this again and again. In the book of Romans, this is what he writes. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, while we were powerless, while we were slaves in Egypt, or slaves in Forbes, or slaves in Molon, while we were that God acted. It is grace alone. That wonderful passage in Ephesians that you will look at this week in your midweek study groups. Ephesians 2. Paul again says this to the church in Ephesus. He says, as for you, we could take that to be as for you, church in Forbes, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. But because of his great love for us, because of Hesed, God, who is rich in mercy and grace, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead. It is by grace you have been saved. You were dead, but God. There's not this. It's <coughs> grace alone. In that first century when this book, when the end of this book was put together, the Apostle Peter addressed the early church council in Jerusalem over the same dilemma as Luther. There were some converts from the Pharisees that were calling on works cooperating with God's grace. That was the Pharisaical era. And these converts, they were calling on some changes. And Peter had something to say about this at the church council in Jerusalem. We would be wise to listen to him. He says, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The conviction that grace alone is what saves the sinner. This is Peter's conviction and it is the conviction of the Christian. Grace alone. And, be, and because of grace alone, there is a ruling out of all forms of self-salvation. you got nothing. You've got nothing to add to your ticket to heaven, so to speak. Our own works cannot contribute or cooperate with God's grace. Instead, the gospel confronts us with our complete inability and the realisation that apart from the grace of God, burn me already. How do the song words go? Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked I come to you for dress. Helpless, I look to you for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly, and I cry, wash me, Saviour, else I die. 
seeing a piece of wood that apparently was from the cross of Jesus. If you add all those pieces of wood up, we have like 18 crosses. Interesting. Crawling up some steps in Rome, as Luther did. Whipping oneself, buying indulgences. If you don't know what an indulgence is, it's basically you're buying a ticket, a piece of paper to get your mother, who's died out of purgatory and into heaven, buying salvation. Constant confession, the acts of monkery, these are helpless. Going to church every Sunday, sitting in the same seat. Donating, these are helpless. And so my challenge to you, are you holding on to your acts of monkery as your ticket to heaven? Are you hoping in your ledger? I'm a decent person. At uni, um, many moons ago now, we uh, with the Christian group there, we'd walk around campus and ask people to fill in a, a survey with us. It was like a, what's the word? An easy way in to start a conversation. And so the last question on there, it was like, you know, what do you think is the meaning of life? What do you think is important in life? Blah, 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 blah. But the last question was, if there is a God and you die tonight or today and you get to the gates of heaven and he says, why should I let you in? What's your answer? What do you think most people's answer is? Because I've been a good person. Not too bad. Hoping in their ledger. What a lie. What an absolute lie they have believed. Because where would you get that notion? You don't get it from this. So we pull that down and what are we putting up instead? The reckonings of men or women, people. Ridiculous. How do they know? No one's come back except one. Interesting. And what did he say? Oh, no, I think we'd better go that way. It is written. Grace alone answers the most basic human question. What must I do to get into heaven? The traditions of mankind say, like you think about it, it is our default position in everything in life to do what? To earn it. You don't just walk up to a girl on the street, guys, talking to guys here, right? You don't just walk up to a girl on the street and go, will you marry me? Generally doesn't work. You actually have to earn it, don't you? You've got to, you've got to woo the lady. You've got to show her gentleness and respect. You've got to earn her trust. You've got to show her that you're decent, blah, 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 however long that takes, before you get the privilege. You've got to earn it. You don't walk into a bank and say, I'll have a loan for $50 million, please. They go, yeah, right. You've got to earn it. You've got to borrow a dollar and pay it back. You've got to borrow $100 and pay it back and build up. You've got to earn it. You don't say to a builder, a real estate agent, I'll have that farm and I don't have any money to buy it. You have to earn it. That's the tradition of mankind. But the Bible doesn't say you earn salvation. In Scripture alone, Luther found, and hopefully I've reminded you, that God's act of salvation is in Christ Jesus. And that is grace and grace alone. Your salvation does not count on you. Praise the Lord. You have nothing to contribute. Forgiveness, salvation, righteousness, right before God, it's all pure and wonderful grace. In that, there is wonderful peace because it doesn't rely on you. And because there... Look at this. Is that two of them? Awesome. And because there is peace, there is that. There is joy. Because... What is your life now? If you've understood this, if you understand that it is God's unmerited gift to you to take you into his family for eternity, 
What is left in life but peace and joy? How does Paul write to the churches that he writes to? Grace be with you, peace and joy. Grace, peace, joy. Grace, peace, joy. Grace, peace, joy. And guess what? The evil one does not like that. In actual fact, what's he going to do? He's going to come chasing you the moment you show joy. In the peace of your life, in communion with your father, because of his grace. He's going to come at you. He's going to throw everything at you because he wants to rip apart your joy because joy changes the world. How does the song go at Christmas? We're not allowed to sing it these days. Joy to the world because the Lord has come. Grace has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature will sing. If we hold on to wonderful joy, it cannot be constrained and it will change the world. If you want to impact Jesus, if you want to impact Forbes for the kingdom of Jesus, go be joyful. Go be joyful. Hey, how's your week been? It's been awesome. Tell me about it. Well, I had a car accident. What do you mean, awesome? Well, I'm alive. (laughs) Or, how's your week been? Oh, terrible. Why? I had a car accident. I'm alive. (laughs) Last week, Scripture alone is never alone. Do you remember that at the end? That though it's Scripture, it's always accompanied by God's people. They have to bring it. Well, grace alone is never alone. It is always accompanied by a response. See, we've got, is it one choice, two options? Is that that how the language should work? You've got one choice to make in regards to grace. You've got two options. You can either say, I do or don't think that Jesus is a historical figure. And I do or don't think that what's written here is true. And I do or don't think that he was nailed to a piece of wood. And I do or don't think that he was buried dead. And I do and I really just don't care if he rose from the dead. Like if that's your position, go along your merry way in the ignorance of your stupidity, frankly. Or your other response is that this is correct, that Jesus is a historical figure, that he is who he claims to be because he was murdered upon a lump of wood. He was buried in the ground by those who know exactly how to kill somebody. And three days later, the body is missing and no one could work out where it went except the 500 witnesses. In which case, that impacts everything. That decision is called faith. And that, my friends, is next week. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for awesome grace. Father, we thank you that this is your character and it cannot be changed by our stupidity. Father, we give you all praise and glory for this. And we do pray over the next few days and weeks that you would wrestle this in our hearts. How awesome is your grace, how free is your grace, and how powerful is your grace. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.